asked if I would better explain the retroperitoneal space and retroperitoneal structures and I'm not going to say no to Vlad uh, and it gives me an opportunity to do a little bit of embryology. I've talked about the posterior abdominal wall before, so the muscles that make the wall, and we've talked about the peritoneum before, but he makes a very good point that I've kind of missed out that crucial idea of the what is retroperitoneal, right? I've got a torso here, I've got some cling film representing peritoneum. And there are a few things that we need to, need to remember. Um, the gastrointestinal tract in the adult is really, really long. And because it's really, really long, it's highly folded and it moves stuff through it. So it needs to be able to move and expand and contract and all that sort of thing. And the peritoneum is very much involved in that. Um, but in the embryo, the gastrointestinal tract just started as a simple tube and the peritoneum lining the early body cavity, the inside of the cavity, covered that early tube. So there was parietal peritoneum lining the wall and visceral peritoneum covering the gastrointestinal tract, covering the simple tube. And then the tube got longer and that peritoneum went with it and made all sorts of structures like the mesenteries, the amenta, um, and spaces like the sacs, right? So in the early stages, all of the gastrointestinal tract, that entire tube, it's really dangerous saying all or entire in anatomy, but you get my gist. <laughs> in, the, in the early stages of development, the whole length of the gastrointestinal tract, or pretty much the whole length of the tube, um, had peritoneum covering it. It was floating inside the peritoneal cavity. It was intraperitoneal. And then, as the gastrointestinal tract developed, some parts of that tract got pulled back and got pulled back to the posterior abdominal wall and fixed in place. And some of that tube remained able to move around in the peritoneal cavity. Those structures that got pulled back, those structures that used to be um, intraperitoneal but then got pulled back to the posterior abdominal wall and fixed in place and don't move around, those are called secondary retroperitoneal structures. They are secondarily retroperitoneal because they used to be intraperitoneal but now they're retroperitoneal. And you'll see why I mentioned that now as we go through. Hey, look, so I've got the cling film here. This is illustrative. This is supposed to uh, demonstrate the concept and make understanding a little bit easier. It is not perfect. It's a plastic model. It's cling film. It's not entirely accurate, but it's, it's intending <laughs> to help explain what I'm trying to explain. All right. Okay, so we've taken away the anterior and anterolateral abdominal walls. We've taken away the skin, we've taken away the layers of muscle, we've taken away the fascia, and now we're down to the parietal peritoneum, uh, which is lining the abdominal cavity, right? If we then open that parietal peritoneum, we can see the gastrointestinal tract. This is shiny because it's covered in visceral peritoneum. This same sheet of peritoneum is a continuous sheet and it's running around to the posterior abdominal wall and then it's running in and it's running out and forming a mesentery and covering the small bowel and covering the large bowel and covering the stomach and it's covering the liver, right? So these are all shiny because they're covered in visceral peritoneum. <laughs> uh, now it gets tricky. Okay, so I wanna, well, if I put my hand here, my hand is in the peritoneal cavity because it's, it's, um, deep to the parietal peritoneum, right? In fact, there it's in the greater sac. The greater sac plus the lesser sac together are the peritoneal cavity. So my hand there is in the peritoneal cavity. I want to take these structures out so we can get to the parietal peritoneum that's covering the posterior abdominal wall. And of course, you know, it's a plastic model in cling film. It's <laughs> not not perfectly anatomically accurate. If I take the liver out, the liver is covered in 
peritoneum. Take the stomach out. The stomach's covered in peritoneum. Actually, um, if I put my finger back here, uh, my fingers are in the lesser sac. So that space there, that's the lesser sac. Posterior is the stomach. So the stomach is covered in visceral peritoneum. We're back now back to the parietal peritoneum back there. Uh, so there are two layers of peritoneum next to each other, which means the stomach can expand, the stomach can move around, it can help with digestion, because of course the stomach fills with food when you eat and then it empties, so it needs to be able to change in size. So that was the lesser sac there. Um, the transverse colon has a mesentery, which means it can also move around. And the small bowel has a mesentery, a very well-developed mesentery. The mesentery supplies all the blood vessels and the nerves and the lymphatics to and from the small bowel. The mesentery is crucial for small bowel function. Okay, now this is fairly representative of the parietal peritoneum again, covering the posterior abdominal wall. And we can see a few things. We can see the ascending colon and the descending colon. So these are parts of the tubes of the gastrointestinal tract, but these are secondarily retroperitoneal. So if this is the parietal peritoneum, we can see through the parietal peritoneum, and the structures that we can see that are posterior to the parietal peritoneum are retroperitoneal. Um, it does actually extend down here, so it's going to cover over the bladder and pelvic structures as well. So we can see that retroperitoneal space through the parietal peritoneum. So the ascending colon and the descending colon are secondarily retroperitoneal, which is great because it means they're fixed in place, they're not going to move around, so once you learn where they are, that's where they are. And we can see the duodenum, so the curve here, the duodenum curving around the pancreas. Uh, now the spleen doesn't count, the spleen well, it's not part of the GI tract, and it happens to be covered in peritoneum, and it does have, happen to cover a ligament, so ignore the spleen, just forget the spleen. The spleen is not retroperitoneal, we're not talking about the spleen today. Um, but the pancreas, or at least most of the pancreas other than the tail, and the duodenum, or at least most of the duodenum other than the first part that's attached to the stomach, those are retroperitoneal and they are secondary retroperitoneal organs. The fact that they're retroperitoneal is great because it means, again, you learn where they are and that's where they're going to stay. They're not going to move around like the small bowel and the stomach and the transverse colon. Like I say, this isn't entirely accurate and we can see some, we can actually see some peritoneal structures back here. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the, this is the parietal peritoneum lining the posterior abdominal wall and that the ascending colon, the descending colon, most of the pancreas and most of the duodenum are secondarily retroperitoneal. They are secondary retroperitoneal structures. And now if we remove the peritoneum and if we remove those secondary perit retroperitoneal structures, now we are looking at retroperitoneal structures, we are in the retroperitoneal cavity or the retroperitoneal space. Um, these are primary retroperitoneal structures. So what are we looking at? What are we including in that list? Most notably, the large blood vessels, the aorta and the inferior vena cava. Um, we can see the diaphragm, we can see quadratus lumborum, we can see iliacus and psoas major and so on. Um, and here is the aorta. It's just passed through the diaphragm. Really, it's snuck down behind it. And the aorta, when it goes through the diaphragm, it's going to give off inferior phrenic branches. It's going to give off these three anterior branches of the gastrointestinal tract, the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery, and inferior mesenteric artery. So these are all retroperitoneal vessels. Now these guys, these three anterior branches, are going to run into the mesentery. That's what the mesentery is for. They're going to run to the tube of the gastrointestinal tract and with them are going to run the nerves and the lymphatics, essentially, right? Um, so these are retroperitoneal and then they enter the peritoneum, they enter the mesentery. 
So we have the aorta descending, and it has two major lateral branches to the, the kidneys. We have the left renal artery and the right renal artery. Notice how the right renal artery is posterior to the inferior vena cava. Um, we will also have a number of suprarenal arteries or adrenal arteries. There's lots of them. I've done a video on that. And they come off various, various vessels around here. Um, and then as we descend, the gonadal arteries, testicular arteries and ovarian arteries, they come from the abdominal aorta. They are lateral branches of the abdominal aorta. So those are retroperitoneal. And as we continue down, well, actually we see, um, we see lumbar branches. They're like the intercostal arteries. The lumbar arteries are gonna run around the body wall. Um, and the aorta is gonna end as the common iliac arteries, so those are retroperitoneal, which will then divide into internal and external iliac arteries, so they're retroperitoneal. Um, also in the middle here, we can see the median sacral artery, much bigger blood vessel if, you, if you're an animal with a nice big tail. In us, it's kind of a diddy thing. Um, so, and you can see, look, as the gonadal arteries continue down, those are all retroperitoneal as well. The inferior vena cava then is a little bit to the right. Um, the internal and external iliac veins come together to form the common iliac veins. The left and right common iliac veins come together to form the inferior vena cava. So those are all retroperitoneal. The renal veins are retroperitoneal. Um, notice how the renal veins are anterior to the arteries. Um, the gonadal veins, well, the right gonadal vein will drain into the inferior vena cava directly. The left gonadal vein will usually drain into the left renal vein and then back. Gonadal again, testicular or ovarian, depending upon the gender. Um, the kidneys, um, they're draining their renal veins back here. The suprarenal veins are draining in there and so on. And then the, the inferior vena cava is going to pass through, well, the liver is going to be wrapped around it and then pass through the diaphragm to get back to the heart. Um, yeah, so all of those blood vessels are retroperitoneal. Now the aorta, um, we have autonomic nerve plexuses, like the celiac plexus and the superior mesenteric plexus. So those autonomic nerve plexuses around the aorta, those are all retroperitoneal. We've got a load of lymph nodes here, haven't we? So the GI tract, for example, is draining its lymph through a a series of nodes to get back to the aorta. So we've got paraaortic lymph nodes, those are all retroperitoneal. And then in terms of organs, oh yeah, the kidneys and the suprarenal glands are obviously retroperitoneal. Like I say, ignore the spleen. The spleen isn't retroperitoneal. Um, it's got it's covered in peritoneum and held in place by the peritoneum. But so the kidneys are retroperitoneal. The suprarenal glands are retroperitoneal. And then you can see that the ureters are running from the kidneys down to the bladder and they're up against the posterior abdominal wall and we've taken the parietal peritoneum off, which means that the ureters are also retroperitoneal. And the peritoneum is draped over the organs of the pelvis. So the bladder is retroperitoneal. I mean, the peritoneum is superior to it, really but the ureter is retroperitoneal, it runs to the bladder and the bladder is retroperitoneal. Likewise, the rectum. Um, we, have a, we have the sigmoid colon becoming the rectum and descending down here. So part of the rectum is, is intraperitoneal, but as it descends and becomes a pelvic structure, it is also retroperitoneal. Does that make sense? If I get some more, if I get some more cling film, that's how it sits upon the pelvic organs so you can you can kind of see how the bladder all those structures in the pelvis then are, are retroperitoneal oh the esophagus is poking in up there as well so the esophagus as it enters the abdomen is <laughs> retroperitoneal so yeah it's peritoneum so it is a tricky concept but this is essentially what we're talking about is that those structures have always been part of the body wall. So those have all be, always been retroperitoneal. This is the peritoneum I've just put on top of it. But the, um, these structures have also been pulled back to the posterior abdominal wall. And they were already covered in peritoneum. So these are also retroperitoneal. How's that? 
um, the retroperitoneal cavity space region. I hope that was clear. It's a difficult thing to describe, just as it's a difficult thing to understand. I have done a very old video on the peritoneum with cling film. I've probably done a few, actually. Uh, one general peritoneum video, then others describing some other intricacies. Um, and I've also talked about the, the post... Well, I've talked about all the abdominal walls, I think. Anyway, if there is anything else about this region that you're interested in, YouTube's got a very good search engine. So search for my name plus whatever structure or region you're interested in, which is why I've named this video as I've named it, because then I think it'll make it easier to find and will help people in the future. Anyway, enough rambling, Sam, come on. Uh, I hope that was interesting and useful. See you next week.